Good afternoon and welcome to this recording by the Multicultural Communities Council of South Australia. My name is George Kuzunis and I'm the CHSP Sector Support and Development Coordinator here. Today, uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting in the, this recording is uh, taking place uh, on the lands of the Ghana people and we pay our respects to their spiritual relationship with the country. Um, we also acknowledge the uh, elders, past, present, and emerging. So today we will be talking about uh, the about governance, uh, governance for community service provider, and with a special focus on cold communities. I'm very glad to have here Elena Müller, who is um, uh, who is from Time Makers Consulting, and she has been presenting. I'm sure some of you have seen her before. She has presented quite a few sessions for us this year. Uh, with excellent uh, feedback, I have to say. So I uh, would like to welcome Elena, and I will let her uh, take on this. Uh, we'll take about an hour, an hour and a half. We'll see how we go, because we have quite a bit to, to cover. So I'll let her take over. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. Thank you for this opportunity to be here today. I'm very excited about this topic of, of governance, particularly um, dealing with cold communities, and particularly being able to help you as you navigate these many changes that um, we'll see, we have seen, and will continue to see in the community services space. Now, this is my name, my, my email address and phone number if you want to get in touch. But I also wanted to say that um, I, as I was preparing this content for today, I couldn't help but um, think about my involvement with boards, but also the specific need and requirements of cold communities having access to appropriate linguistically, culturally appropriate services to them. I am from Brazil and I've been in Australia for about 17 years now. And as I see my own parents age and probably need some specific services um, in the very near future, I wonder how that's going to go because currently there is no, um, you know, there is a Brazilian association, but there is no specific linguistic appropriate services for uh, Portuguese speakers in South Australia. So this is certainly, it's not something that I'll be just going through with you. This is something that's also very close to my heart. And um, I really admire the work that you are doing in your communities and see the great need and benefit of it. Now, we are here today um, and re rehashing the objective of today's session. Really, this whole webinar and this whole content was created for community providers offering services to older people in cold communities. That's all of you. I had the opportunity to have a bit of a sneak peek on the attendance list, and uh, I saw all the different organizations that you're coming from and that you're representing here today, as well as your different roles and responsibilities within those. So we do have people who are... Um, serving on boards, and we also have executive management. Um, so I have created today's content with this in mind and ensuring that there is enough for, for both sides, uh, both the board and management, to, to take some actionable steps from today's session. You'll also be receiving um, a number of, of materials um, that have been developed specifically for the not-for-profit sector. Um, regarding governance, but also I've created a checklist for you to use, but we'll be sharing those with those resources with you um, later on or as part of this, this session. Now, another objective is that we all know that good governance will lead to better service provision and better outcomes for older people and for our clients. So the aim for today is to provide an understanding of the importance of governance and the fact that you are here today tells me that you already know that it's important, otherwise you wouldn't you know, waste your time coming along. But we'll also be looking at key components and how it can be effectively implemented, some things to think about. You'll not be doing everything wrong, you won't be doing everything right, there's always points for or areas for improvement. And I'm really hoping that you can take uh, quite a few pointers from today's session. Now, as I'm going through a number of different areas and a number of different um, characteristics of good governance, 
it would be great if you had at the end of the session, you know, a bit of a list going on of things that you have learned, things that you'll be telling others and things that you will do. Obviously, it would be a waste of my time and your time and George's time if we are all coming along here and then there's no change at all of current practices, there's no improvement, there's no benefit to your organization after attending here today. So I'm really hoping that by having this commitment um, to what you will do, we can see some, some improvements and some benefits um, to your organization, but also to your clients. Okay, this is the plan for today. First, we're going to look at the importance of governance. And I know you all agree that it's important, but I will just um, spend a bit of time giving you a concept of governance and then looking at what good governance looks like, but also what bad governance looks like. Then we'll go and spend a fair bit of time on governance principles. Now, these, there are 10 principles that are directly related to not-for-profit governance. That's all of us here today. So... I'll be sharing those with you, and they are directly from the Australian Institute of Company Directors. And once we go through them, I'll also be looking at um, questions or how it relates to the board and how it relates to management. So we'll take our time through each of them. I do recommend that as I'm going through those, you have the AICD or Australia Institute of Company Directors not-for-profit governance principles in front of you as it will make it easier for you to consider, but also to decide which of those aspects um, you may need to work on. Then we're going to look at three case studies and um, of you know community services providers that have um, had an issue in one of those areas, one of those 10 areas, and what they've done to improve them and what the result has been. As I mentioned before, I have checked all the different organizations represented here today, and none of the case studies or examples that I'll share are from any of those. Um, I'm very mindful of the fact that um, you know South Australia has got a number of different not-for-profits, but also I'd like to respect. And as I'm sharing things that you know didn't go so well or went well, etc., it's for your benefit and learning, um, not to you know name and shame anyone, which I will not be doing. And the fourth aspect of today or point for today is uh, are some additional resources. So if you want to go on and um, know more about governance, where do you go? Where are there free resources, free webinars, and also um, a paid resource pertaining to clinical governance as well? By the way, we'll not be covering clinical governance today at all. That's not my specialty. My specialty is predominantly in uh, processes and systems and governance itself, not clinical. I'm not um, from the clinical space at all. So I have added um, a resource about clinical governance for you to look at if that's an area that you want to improve in or your organization needs to improve in. Okay, the importance of governance. Now, I am sure that all of you have seen this roadmap, which was published on the 6th of June of this year. I don't know about you, but looking at that roadmap and looking at everything that has already happened, all the different activities and, and um, improvements and changes and everything that will still happen, um, it can be quite overwhelming. And I think when we are also looking at the, the changes of dates and the fact that we don't know exactly how or what the restructuring or the changes to community services are going to be or to home, um, home care particularly will be, it can be quite overwhelming. My role here today and what I'm hoping that it will help you is that by looking at what you can improve and what you can consider between now and 2025 when the changes will come into effect, you can be in a much better place governance-wise and be able to then attack or, or tackle those changes that are coming with a much stronger framework for both your board 
and your management. Okay, what is governance? That's the first question for today. Um, it's one of those words that uh, we, you may hear a lot, we may talk about a lot, but people are not quite sure what it means. So maybe all of you do, for my own benefit then, uh, and George's, I'll share with you uh, what it is. So some key words for governance. So if you, if you, we were to ask people, what does governance means, um, or mean? They, these are probably some of the words that would come up. So accountability, transparency, decision-making or how decisions are made, compliance, ethics, oversight, uh, stakeholders, engagement, uh, risk management, leadership, and policies and procedures. But I thought it would be worthwhile to actually share with you one of the most accepted um, corporate governance definitions that there is which was um, said or coined by the Honourable Justice Neville Owen, who was head of the Royal Commission into HIH Insurance. Now, what he said, and it's still accepted um, certainly by the by AICD, so Australian, um, oh gosh, yeah, by the AICD, the Australian Institute of Company Directors, they accept this as the, as the definition of governance. Governance is the framework of rules, relationships, systems and processes within and by which authority is exercised and controlled in corporations. In our case, it would be in organizations. It encompasses the mechanisms by which companies and those in control are held to account. There's some strong words there when it talks about, you know, authority and control, which, um, you know, people may react differently to. But Overall, it's really talking about who's got authority within a business or an organization, and that would be uh, the board of management or advisory committee or committee or whatever the name of that governing body that your organization has. That's their authority. And they are the ones in control as well. Um, them, so this governing body in whichever shape it is for your organization, and then the management team who are appointed by um, and performance and whose performance is also managed by the governing body. Something that I thought would be worthwhile to share is that while not many people you know, know what good governance is, everyone knows what bad governance looks like and what bad governance leads to. And these are just some, um, some words, but there's a lot more. But basically it would be the lack of transparency, lack of stakeholder engagement. So decisions are made without consultation, communication or engagement of stakeholders or clients. Lack of accountability, people are doing whatever. Abuse of power, corruption, fraud, ineffective decision making. We've all heard of boards that discuss, discuss the same things time and time again and no decisions are made. Inadequate risk management. There's no risk mitigation. There's no plan. An emergency happens and no one knows what to do. There's no framework for risk. Neglect of fiduciary duties. So fiduciary duties relates to as, as part of the governing body. So let's say I will use the board of directors for the purposes of this webinar. So as part of the board of directors, there are responsibilities linked to that. And there's lots of them, legal responsibilities. But one of them is linked to how you have a responsibility to act in the best interest of the members of that organization. And that's a duty that um, directors have to have. So if directors are acting on their best interest, that's a neglect of fiduciary duties because it should also always be based on um, the others, the members, the clients. That's why the director is in that position of power and, and um, authority. And then the last one would be lack of strategic direction. I'm going to cover a lot more um, about those and give you examples so that you're very clear about them. I think ultimately the importance and the vision for good governance um, for community services provision is that we've got high quality, consistent service delivery to all clients 
in every interaction. So this is not about sometimes providing um, good quality services to some clients, but it's that consistency across all. Now, let's look at the key components of effective governance. Now, as I mentioned, we will be looking at this, these principles that were published and released by the Australian Institute of Company Directors. There are two files that you receive as part of this webinar. One is a snapshot, which is the picture I've got there for you, the cover. And the other one is the full report or the full document. The snapshot is about nine pages long. The full um, principles document is 104 pages long. Obviously, to prepare for this webinar, I, I have consulted both and considered both. Um, I would say that depending on which area you need to sort of know more of or you're more interested in, maybe you read that specific principle. You don't necessarily need to read the whole thing. But I'll leave it up to you. And I would recommend that as I'm going through each of the principles and um, outcomes or required or preferred or the exact words that they use is... Oh. here, supporting practices, um, it would be great if you had that in front of you. So grab a hold of, of the snapshot report and let's go. Okay, the first principle relates to purpose and strategy. In here, as you can see, I have included some considerations for the board itself, as well as some for the executive. So the considerations for the board um, are, is there a purpose for the organization? I'm sure there are. Is it documented? If it's documented, when was it done the last time? When it was reviewed? Is that still the purpose that um, the board stands behind and pushes through to the executive and other staff? If the purpose is the latest one and the one that everyone is agreeing to and committed to, do we have an updated relevant strategy linked to that? And has there been a recent review of the strategy? Now, what I'm seeing in a lot of boards um, lately is the review of strategy. So in this um, current, you know, I would say business environment that's quite um, volatile and with lots of changes, there is the need for lots of organizations are having to review their purpose less so, but certainly their strategy. These are some of the considerations for the board. I would recommend you go through uh, the checklist that uh, we have provided as part of this webinar to look at all the principles uh, under principle one, all those sort of dot points that you need to consider and ensure that you have in place. For the executive, we have different considerations. Are staff aware of the organization's purpose? I think that's one of those things, you know, we as a board, we know what the purpose is. We as exec know what the purpose is, but sometimes staff and volunteers, they, are, they may have an idea of what it is, but they don't know for sure. It's very important that they know that it's, um, they are aware of that and that they live that. And the other thing for exec as well is our vision, mission, values inbuilt into all tasks undertaken by the organization. So this is not just about having a nice, well-designed piece of, of paper or document, you know, um, available for staff when they get hired. But it's about ensuring that recruitment practices, ensuring that their performance development plans, ensuring that their training programs, everything is underpinned by the vision, mission, and values. Now, I've got lots of notes, so don't mind me as I go through them because, ah, yes, I, I try to get examples for you, like real examples in real organizations um, under the community services banner that I could relate to, to each of the principles. And the example here is, um, I remember being involved in a strategic planning day 
this was done at the business unit level. So the board had already prepared the vision, mission, values, and they had recently undergone a review of those. So we had the new ones now. And then at a business level, business unit level, um, the manager wanted to do, obviously, the general manager decided to do with all staff a strategic planning day, looking at, okay, looking at these values, what what what's our role as a business unit within those? And um, lots of people came with lots of ideas about what they thought, you know, should should happen and, and things that we could do. But I remember coming back to th this manager always coming back to how does this relate to the vision? How does this how does this relate to the mission? Because people were bringing ideas that didn't actually relate and worse that some of their ideas, they could not provide that service or product to all clients who wanted it. So then you end up in, in, a, in a manner that you need to pick and choose who you're going to provide it to, which then creates other issues of um, you know preferential treatment and all of that. So it's very important that staff is also involved um, and aware of those, both the purpose um, and, and somewhat the strategy in what it refers to them or relates to them. Number two relates to roles and responsibilities, okay? Um, considerations for the board are the obvious ones, you know, are directors meeting their duties under the law? So these are the main four areas of, of legal uh, implications for directors, you know, uh, the, the duty to act in good faith for a proper purpose. And this relates to back to in whose interest is this decision being made? Is this on my own interest? Is this in the interest of um, the stakeholders and the members and the people that we serve? To act with reasonable care, skill and diligence. Again, um, not improperly using information or position. So I'm not um, pushing my own agenda based on my role. Um, I'm always acting on behalf of others and not using um, insider, insider information for, uh, for my own gain or that of my family. And then conflict of interest, they need to get, you know, disclosed and managed. And, you know, depending on what it is, um, and I've seen that happen before, the best option uh, might be for that board member or, or director to either not be involved in that conversation about, you know, if there is a clear conflict of interest or uh, leave the board altogether if the conflict of interest cannot be resolved um, and if there's going to be an ongoing conflict of interest in regards to that. When we're looking at the executive, um, it's really very important that there is clarity about the role of the board and the role of management. This actually applies to, to both sides, uh, both the directors, but also exec. They need to know what each person is doing and how. See. And, and our delegations in place. So if the exec um, can, if the, the board has delegated to the exec to complete certain things or to, to have approval and to have independence in certain areas, um, that needs to be communicated as well. So an example of that um, is, which I'll provide, which I've seen happen. Um, there was a client, so this is community services organization um, here based in South Australia, and the, the client was in arrears. And the staff member who was looking after billing, all accounts for that matter, the staff member didn't say um, anything to anyone. Um, within within the business, didn't disclose that to the manager. When that staff member left, the business found that, or the organization found that um, one of the, the client was significantly in arrears. What was discovered is that the client was helping family, was on a pension, you know, like every, most of, most of our clients was on a pension and was actually sending money um, to their family in a different country. So they were sort of supporting their family in that manner. But as a result, they were sort of not paying in full um, any bills or charges related to their own care and support that they required to be able to continue to live in their own home. When we talk about, you know, and I'm not saying 
oh, that, that was the wrong thing to do or that was the right thing to do. But when we're looking at role of board and role of management, I think this is a great example because um, this issue needed to be raised through management and potentially through the board so that the board could discuss how are we going to deal with financial hardship? And I think this is a very timely discussion of financial hardship because um, we are seeing um, all over Australia an increased cost of living costs. We know that. And that is going to obviously filter down to, to the older population and to all of our clients. So it's not really up to staff to decide based on you know their good heart, et cetera. And I know that we hire staff because they had they have the right values and they care about the communities. But it would be the role of the board to decide how we're going to deal with financial hardship. We, there needs to be a clear process and it's fair to all clients. So clients are aware of how they can apply for it. They are aware of what the process is. Staff is aware of what the process is. And then there's fairness. Remember when I talked about um, what bad governance looks like? Um, that would be a case of that. So there were more than one client with financial hardship, but only one was, was sort of, yeah, don't worry, you, you only pay half, that's okay, we'll carry over, while the other ones are paying. So there needs to be that clear, that clarity of roles and responsibilities between board and management, but also, um, the board is determining those processes and, and systems and principles for staff to then um, follow when those situations um, come along. Number three is about board composition. And board composition is a very interesting one because um, it's actually, as I was you know, doing uh, gathering some, some data for today, this keeps coming up. And I'll share with you in a moment uh, one report done with over 2,000 board members across Australia, which was only released two weeks ago. And board composition, again, is one of the main concerns of boards uh, for the next 12 months or main focuses for boards for the next 12 months. So when we look at board composition, and I would you know, strongly recommend that you do read all the materials related to principle three, board composition, because that will help you um, gain a better, a better understanding and also decide what's right for you and your organization to do in regards to that. But some of the considerations for the board on this specifically are, are directors appointed on merit and via transparent process? So, you know, in the olden days, in the past, it would be a bit like, oh, does anyone know anyone who knows someone? We have a board vacancy. You know, do you know, do you have someone that would be interested? That's not necessarily a transparent process um, that needs to be more scrutiny and more options for candidates to, to a board member position. It's a big responsibility, as we know. Um, and it needs to be the right person for the role and the organization as well. So I've seen lately, I've seen a lot of um, not-for-profits utilizing recruiters to find board members. You know, it's up to you what you do. But if I had to advertise for board members, I would be not using a recruiter. I would be using uh, the website from Women on Boards. I would also be using SEEK. Dot com, I've seen an increase of, of board positions being advertised through there with quite a good success rate because you end up attracting people that would not normally apply for those roles. Obviously, the AICG website also has an area where members can you know, apply and, and, and advertise board roles but then you would be getting a specific group of people only. I would probably recommend, you know, seek.com um, as well as uh, women on boards and some other sort of smaller websites that aggregate board positions. It's very important that you have a policy and procedure as well about uh, board directors recruitment and induction for that matter. Um, 
when we're talking about board composition as well, we are talking about the different skills and requirements that that board requires. So question here is, is the composition of the board what it needs to be? So if we have a purpose as an organization, we have a strategy to achieve that purpose, but then other people on the board that we have right now, do we have the sufficient skills and knowledge and experience to help support um, management achieve that? And sometimes the answer is going to be yes, and sometimes it's going to be no. It's a matter of you know what's missing and how we then recruit that that new director with those skills. In order to know what's missing or what's required, um, it's very important to have a skills matrix completed and kept updated because there's no point completing it say five years ago and now half of the board has changed and that that document is no longer relevant. So I've I've only recently completed. Um, you know, my own skills matrix for, for a board that I serve on. And I would, you know, probably say that it's, it's a very important, well, I'm not saying that, that's, you know, good governance, that um, the board needs to have a completed skills mat matrix where you outline all the uh, experiences, characteristics, traits, knowledge that the, the whole board needs to have within your organization and then you check who has got what level and what's missing and then you you try to uh, recruit that person is there succession planning in place now this is something that i have not seen often um it's it's hard in some in some organizations particularly as i'm saying that a lot more boards are paying their board members and obviously the majority of our boards that, that we're represent, representing here today, where we are um, mostly, I believe, relying on volunteer board directors. So it's sometimes a challenge to both attract, uh, but also to retrain and to ensure that we have enough directors um, sort of stepping in so that as people uh, retire or move on to other boards, uh, we have that continuity of skill set and that the the organization can continue to perform at a very high level another one that i have only seen um probably in the last two years um is that the constitution gets established or the board charter for that matter it gets established it gets approved by the members great and then no one ever reads that again. Now, I could be unfair. I'm, I'm probably, you know, um, I'm sure all of you here in this in this webinar read the Constitution and you've read it recently and you know what's in it. But many people don't. The ones that are not here, they don't. And what happens is that the Constitution ends up, if it's not reviewed regularly, it ends up being outdated. Um, because the Constitution needs to be approved by the members, the changes to it need to be approved by the members. You know, there's a process involved there, but it would probably be a good idea to have a, a review of it, particularly as there are things, there could be things in there, including, you know, number of meetings, um, if it's remunerated or not. And one that I've seen recently, the constitution included names of board members and half of those names were no longer on the board, but the constitution was still there. So it's it's better to sort of have a have a bit of a look and review it, particularly because with the changes coming in 2025, chances are that you know it could be reviewed again by that time. But if you bring it now to the level that it should be, then there would be you no know, potentially some minor changes only in 2025. But you don't want to have all of that work to be doing now. Another thing that you need to consider is the tenure for directors. So obviously, you know, um, as the needs of the organization change, you don't, the directors that have been there in the past may not be the right people to continue on in the future. Um, only the board can determine if, if that's the case or not. 
But if you're going to review the constitution, it, it's probably beneficial to review uh, tenure for directors, not just, you know, if it's two years, if it's three years, however long it is, but also how many times they can be reappointed. Because you, you may, but you may not want people to be reappointed forever. It's, it's really a discussion to be had and, and for the boards to consider. Now, I wanted to share with you, and we will share that in the resources available after this webinar, um, but I wanted to share with you this, this not-for-profit governance and performance study 22-23. This is a report that gets published every year by the Australian Institute of Company Directors, and I know I said their name like 70 th times by now, and I apologize, but they have really good material that's free and available to everyone. And it is, you know, sort of the standard and the, the voice of um, governance in Australia. So it's timely and it's appropriate that I mentioned them. This report was only published about two weeks ago. And I got the main points for you, particularly as we talk about board composition. And it has been something that was um, ranked here as well. Look, I wanted to share the, the key report, uh, report findings related to governance. There were five, but of those five, two were very related, totally related to governance. One was that directors are having, directors are having to make changes to governance practices. So in the past, um, and that is still, you know, taught in, 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 in governance uh, theories and governance courses, the idea of a director is like someone is on a balcony and looks down at the garden. They can see the whole garden. They can see what, where needs more work, where needs more love, what's doing well, what's not. And then they tell who's working on the garden what needs to be done. They're watching, they're not doing. That's also known as um, a noses in fingers out approach, which I thought was quite funny. Now, since COVID um, and all the changes that have, have happened since, directors, and this showed up in these reports, directors uh, are having to make changes to governance practices. This means that they had to spend a lot more time doing board-related tasks, but also at times, and as the need, um, you know, as the emergency took place of whichever sort it was, either compliance or COVID or whichever one, directors actually had to go into the business and, and help in any way that there was. Now, historically, that's been um, something that, you know, in governance circles, they say, oh, that's a no-no, you sort of, you watch, you don't do. But as this report shows, and um, certainly looking in more detail at what was mentioned under these uh, findings, this was one of the things that was showing that um, directors were having to be to be and to act a lot more hands on rather than, uh, you know, a, keeping a step back at all times. It's also highlighted that they are spending more time, about 44% uh, of directors are spending more time in their duties as a director of the organization than they used to in, in the previous year. The other key finding is that there's been uh, significant changing in external factors like legislation, like workforce shortages, et cetera, but also stakeholders' expectations. Again, in the case, in my view of, of community services providers, the stakeholders' expectations and the changes in um, not yet legislation, but the changes that are coming uh, in regards to how services are provided, how funding is provided, et cetera, in 2025, are for sure going to, again, change expectations of, of, of clients, for sure, of their families, absolutely. And it's how we respond to that. Now, the top three priorities uh, for organizations for the next 12 months. As I said, over 200 directors um, responded to the to this survey and this is what they said the top three priorities are how to respond to changes in the operational environment and that's exactly um 
you know, what we're talking about here today, what we are preparing for here today. And when we look at governance, it's because we know there'll be changes and we're looking at how, how can we make our processes and systems more sturdy to then withstand um, when these changes come. The second one, which I'm sure everyone will agree, um, is workforce. That's a big focus and a big challenge as well. I think particularly as you are dealing with cold communities, um, because then you end up having, obviously, extra requirements of your staff, like that they understand or, or speak a certain language or that they understand and uh, respect a certain culture that not any staff will have. So that diminishes the number of people that you can appoint in volunteering or paid positions that you have within your organization. And the third one that may or may not apply to, to you are diversify income sources. I know some of you are looking at that, um, but you know, just sharing with you what um, other not-for-profit organizations are focusing on. And then there's these three priorities that uh, boards are focusing on over the next three months. And the first one, and I was very surprised, and that's why I'm presenting this here under um, standard three, is board composition. Sorry, not standard three, principle three. These are not standards, these are principles. Uh, it's improved board composition. So obviously boards are finding that they need more uh, or a specific skill, experience that they don't currently have on their board right now. And that could be clinical, that could be financial, that could be business improvement, that could be change management, that could be a number of different things. That could be, depending on um, on your organization, it could even be related to, to data and cyber as well. I've seen uh, a significant increase, obviously, in uh, companies and organizations looking for people from the IT field or background as board members, as organizations prepare to... Um, ensure that their data and that of their clients is safe from cyber attacks. Um, the second priority is develop a new strategic plan, which we already mentioned, that was principle one. And the third one is regular review to track progress against organizational goals. And this would be, you know, how reports are, are written and how often they're received and how we can track progress to then make decisions about um, the business and what needs to happen. Great. Principle four relates to board effectiveness. Um, this is quite specific to the board in particularly, obviously looking at board meetings, um, board papers, and the, the relationship between board and management. But so it could be that, you know, in considering what's working well and what could be improved in your board, it could be that you decide for shorter but more frequent meetings, um, uh, some changes in, in the way board papers are written or the type of information that you receive, uh, the establishment of subcommittees. I've seen um, quite a few organizations creating those recently as, so instead of, increasing frequency of board meetings. They've established subcom subcommittees in between board meetings or within the same month or whatever. And then these subcommittees in different areas, they then report um, to the board on those areas and they can do more work and things can move faster um, between each board meeting. I also note that um, in the Royal Commission, there was a mention of care committees and that, you know, providers, one of the recommendations was that providers uh, rely on care committees as primary source of information to ensure appropriate care is being provided to clients. The report from the AICD that I just, you know, mentioned and, and showed you part of has said based on their survey of, of about 2000 um, directors, it said that it has appeared quite low on their survey 
that organizations are actually using these care committees and that they have them at all. So certainly when we took when we are looking at our board effectiveness and and certainly touching on the clinical governance aspect, which depending on the product, you know, the the, the services that you are providing, you would need to have a very sturdy, you know, um, governance on the clinical side. I would strongly encourage you to to consider and your boards to consider if you need um, and and establish this a care committee as well as part of your you know board effectiveness, but also part of your um, overall governance. And this is something that got flagged um, on the AICG report as well. Considerations for the executive: What is the information required by the board? I would recommend a review of information that you're currently providing to see if that's still relevant to the board. And if not, what is the information that is required? I mean, as things are moving so quickly, it's important to ensure that there's still relevance in the, in the reports being created, particularly because those reports, they take hours and sometimes days to create. And if, you know, no one is reading them or they are no longer relevant. As the exec, you don't want to be creating them for no reason. So, you know, how, how can this um, data or information be provided promptly and efficiently? You don't want to be just using all of your time to, to be creating reports. You want to know that the reports you are creating are useful and required by the board for decision making. Um, secondly, you know, what can you do to support the board? Um, more, there's increased scrutiny. So it's also important that exec uh, sort of considers that and how they can support more, if that's the case. And um, what can be improved in the relationship between board and management or management and board? That's always, you know, something that uh, both parties, both board and exec need to consider because the stronger that relationship is, the better outcomes the better uh, quality of organization there will be, but also the better outcomes and service delivery for clients. Okay, risk management. Risk management for the board. Is there a risk framework in place? Oh. How often is that risk framework reviewed? Has a risk appetite statement been reviewed and communicated to management? So for decisions to be made, um, if you're delegating to management to make some decisions, it's very important that the board has very clearly what is the risk that they are prepared to take, if any, in which areas, so that management then can make the right decisions accordingly. And um, how is clinical governance managed as well? Um, you know, again, within risk management, if you are delivering clinical services, uh, clinical governance is a, is a you know, top of mind, it's the highest risk you've got. And it's very important that you consider management of, of that. And how, what the, what's the framework, what's in place? Do you have a care committee? Do you, what do you have in place to ensure that um, that's being, the risk is mitigated? For example, um, how often are risks raised with the board? Are they part of the reporting? What's in place to implement, monitor, review, and improve risk management within the organization? That needs to be considered as well. And are there sufficient policies in place? And is the staff aware and trained? So I've been um, in an organization recently where all the policies and procedures were in place, but they had not been communicated to staff. So staff knew that they were in a folder in the office, but they had no access to them unless they physically went and grabbed the folder. So as they were out and about, they really didn't have um, access to them and they had not been trained in them. So they knew they existed. They didn't know what was in them. That's a problem. That's, you know, in so many levels. Another risk that, you know, people have been talking about and I've seen an increase, unfortunately, particularly in... Um, you know, retirement villages, but also community services providers is cyber attacks. 
So I've spoken to a, a specialist, uh, a cybersecurity specialist on why this is happening because um, hackers or, you know, these threat, threat actors are attacking websites. They're bringing down websites of all sorts of quite small providers. And what this specialist said was that when these hackers are learning their craft, they will try with small, low security websites first. And then they practice taking them down, taking them down, taking them down. And then as they practice that, they then sort of graduate to more complex and, and harder um, websites or, or actions or crime, really. So there's been an increase on that. Uh, boards need to be aware of that, exactly need to be aware of that, because it, it could well be that that happens to you and you need to be prepared to defend. It's it's always better to have the right defense so they don't break down your website, they don't um, get your data, than what it is afterwards to have to, you know, tell all your clients that their information was was stolen, etc. But that's certainly a risk that even though, you know, we are not on, on the technology space, we are on the people business. We, we, we do this because we love people. It's very important that this gets considered because there's whole, unfortunately, there's whole teams overseas of cyber criminals that are targeting Australia. I know you know this, but as a board, you need to consider that and think about frameworks um, and include that in your risk framework. Cool. Principle six relates to performance. So in this principle, it's, it's performance of all resources that you have. So as a board, consider performance of all resources. For example, financial, obviously, that's the one we think about. Um, human, the people, staff, volunteers, the people that contribute to the organization, but also physical. So do you have any equipment? Do you have any property? What are these resources being used appropriately? Then we look at performance of the whole organization. How is it being measured? What's the defi definition of success? And is the information you're receiving from management sufficient to discharge director's responsibilities? From the management side or the exact side, are all stuff so it flows it flows over right so here on the board side we're going what's the agreed definition of success then on the management side we've got are all staff aware of what success looks like how do we measure the impact we have in our clients lives and how do we capture information in an automated manner so that reporting can be done easily accurately and in real time you don't want to be using, I'm sure, uh, exec and staff, they don't want to be using all of their time writing reports for the board. At the same time, board needs to know what the performance is, how things are going, so they can make decisions. So it's a fine line um, for exec. The more automated report, reporting can be, uh, the better it will be for all parties involved. Obviously, there could well be, you know, the, there is generally um, a setup cost but then the, the savings in time and effort by staff um, and the speed that data is provided to the board certainly outweigh, outweigh the, um, the investment in time and money to do so. With this one, I, I wanted to share with you an example of a business that was providing chips. So they did a lot of gardening to different clients um, and what they found was that staff were using the gardening tools from the organization to provide services to clients' family members on weekends. Now, these family members, these clients sort of, you know, family and friends, they were not clients of the organization. The staff were effectively being like a contractor and providing cash in hand services, we're making some extra money and we're using the resources of the organization. 
Again, when we look at that question, are resources used appropriately? In this case, these were physical resources. So these were tools and different products like um, mulch and compost and things like that, that they were just taking from, from sort of the shed, the, the, um, yeah, the shed where, where those products, those tools and products were kept. Tools were going missing. They were, they were sometimes broken. They were not there when people needed. So staff were coming in on Monday, say, and then there was something missing. So they couldn't do the work. So that was a, a big problem um, that one specific um, board and management both had to deal with because resources were not being used appropriately and, in fact, were um, getting in the way of the organization providing services to clients. Number seven relates to accountability and transparency. So obviously, as a minimum, um, you would be providing to your members or clients, depending on the structure of your organization, you'd be you would be having you know an AG, an annual general meeting every year, and um, providing you know an annual annual report, financial reporting for the year, uh, audited statements. Etc. You would you would be providing that as a, as a met, as a matter of course. Um, considerations for the board to ensure that you know the the principle of accountability and transparency is there um, or is met is to whom is this organization accountable? See, having clarity of why are we here and and why we're we doing this work, which again links back to the purpose. But thinking about who are we accountable to, um, it's a very important thing to always have in mind as a board member. What information do clients need? Um, sometimes I've seen organizations providing way too much information to clients, information that they didn't really care, they didn't really you know, want to know, and then not providing information that clients actually wanted. So when you look at principle seven, there will be um, a list of, of information that and what best practice would be and what type of information to provide to members. How do we communicate with clients about decisions that affect them? The board needs to consider that. Is the communication coming from the board? Is communication coming from management? Um, how often is that communication done? How much notice are, are clients given? Obviously, some of these things will be covered by legislation, but and then we follow whatever the legislation says, but not all. So these are things that you need to consider to ensure that um, the principle of accountability and transparency is followed. Considerations for exec would be, again, that clarity between the role of the board and management. I've seen a, a board and management relationship once um, that was not going too well. And what happened is that the board was communicating with the, with the clients and then management as well. But if because they were not sharing the messaging that they were sending, the client would receive both messages and they were not necessarily aligned. That created all sorts of issues, obviously. That created all sorts of confusion and issues and complaints and whatever because clients were just really confused by what was happening. Um, another consideration for exec would be, you know, how, how do we engage and consult with clients? Is that recurring? Is that a once-off? Um, how is it done uh, when we need to, to, to engage and consult? Principle eight is stakeholder engagement, which is a good segue from, from what we just said. So is there clarity from the board perspective? Is there clarity on who are the organization stakeholders, what their needs are and their expectations? And stakeholders are not necessarily just your clients. It could be the government department. It could be the neighboring property to where you provide services from. Or it could be a number, a number of different stakeholders, depending on what your organization does and, and who the clients are and what services you provide within the community services space. Uh, what are the stakeholders' perception of the organization and what's its impact? Is there a framework in place? Because if there isn't, there should be. We need to develop one. 
and how are vulnerable clients protected by the organization? Now, I'm 100% sure of this. All of us in this webinar are dealing with vulnerable clients, 100%. So we need to, uh, to have that structure, that framework in place to ensure that we're doing everything we can to protect them. Considerations for the exec. Client feedback. What's the process for gathering, responding, and reporting? There's no point gathering and responding if then the board is not aware of them. Now, the board doesn't need to know the detail, but they need to know that there has been X number of complaints, and these are the general topics. They need to be able to see that there is a trend or not of what's going on. Is the engagement with clients appropriate and relevant pertaining to decisions which affect them? Obviously, you don't need to engage with clients about every decision that, that you make. But if the decision affects them directly, affects their services, affects their engagement with you, then obviously that needs to be um, considered and done appropriately. Are there processes in place and staff awareness on how to protect vulnerable clients? And does this work in practice? Sometimes things are done in a way that it's like, oh yeah, tick, 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 all done. We have here for compliance, but in practice, it's not happening. So how do we um, ensure that those processes are being followed? day in, day out. Um, I wanted to share a very brief example here when we're talking about stakeholder engagement. Um, you know, there was one, one provider, this was a code uh, provider, and they used to have specific, uh, they were center-based, so the clients would come in to this, to their center, and one of the neighbors absolutely hated the fact that they were there. And this was not about the community. This is just about the fact that, you know, there was movement, there was people coming in and out. Um, there were these events. Sometimes there were weekend events as well uh, during the day, but this neighbor hated that and created all sorts of, um, of issues and put complaints in and sort of inked, what's, what's the word? Um, spray canned their windows and just really nasty type thing. Well, what happened is that this neighbor, the nasty neighbor, um, came into some financial difficulty in these, these last years, like, you know, 20 years of, of, of that going on. And this neighbor came into some financial difficulties and the, you know, community center, the, the community got together, put some money together and bought the neighbor's property. So that resolved that stakeholder, um, you know, I hope it would be so easy for, for all of us who have you know trouble with some neighbors or whatever. It's not, but I thought it was a bit of an interesting story to share with you when we're talking about stakeholders and, and how to engage or manage them. Principle nine, we're almost at the end of the principles. Okay, this one relates to, con to conduct and compliance. Now, when we're looking at that, the most important thing for the board is that a code of conduct is in place. If there is no code of conduct, that's when, well, even with a code of conduct, weird things may happen or misbehavior may occur um, within the organization. But I'll give you just one example of something that I've seen recently, last year, which was a family. So this was a, you know, help at home arrangement. So the workers were coming into this um, older dementia client and he the family really liked one staff member in particular over all others as it common is with families or or you know the the client themselves they have a preference for one so this family spoke directly with the worker and they said look if you take all of the shifts that we want we will pay you extra on the side every month. And they agreed on an amount. Now, obviously, that's a, a problem, uh, a big one, a problem of misconduct. 
um, and a problem of in so many levels that I'm never going to you know, tell you because you know this, that this should not happen. In this specific case, there was no code of conduct. So it became, you know, really hard because the staff is saying, well, it's not written anywhere that I can't do that. And, and then created angst with the other staff. And it was a it was a big, it was a big problem. The board needs to set up a code of conduct. And then management needs to ensure that acceptable and unacceptable behaviors are clearly communicated to all staff and volunteers. Now, it, it's not enough. To say, to say, include the code of conduct as part of the contract. That's good. Talk about the code of conduct at induction. Good. But it needs to be ongoing. It needs to be spoken to at you know, staff meetings. It needs to be talked about in the newsletter. It's not, you know, people forget and people, they don't necessarily are going to remember everything. It's management and the day-to-day -day task to ensure that staff and volunteers are aware of what those behaviors are, the acceptable behaviors, what the code of conduct is. Now, for the board, how do we oversee compliance with relevant laws, regulations, and internal policies? For the exec, um, they need to consider the processes in place. For, for dealing with compliance. So they need to know what the tasks are that they need to do, the reportings, uh, the reports that need to be in at which time and to which government department. Again, only recently um, I helped a company that hadn't submitted um, one of their reporting to a specific government department for five years. It just hadn't been done, it was in someone's drawer, the staff member uh, resigned and left. And, um, you know, those that were left found that information. Um, it's a breach of compliance, it's, it's not great. So how does the board can oversee that what needs to be done is being done? Uh, the other one is related to conflicts of interest. So conflicts of interest within the board need to be identified, disclosed and managed. But one thing that we see less of is conflict of interest could also happen um, with management staff volunteers. And how is that managed at that level? How is that managed within the organization, not just at board level? That's generally done, done well. Um, I mean, you know, every board meeting should have a conflict of interest uh, agenda item that those uh, perceived or real conflicts are shared and discussed and decided, but I don't see that happening a lot during staff meetings, for instance. Um, then for the board, is there a process for investigating misconduct? Again, things need to be done in a clear and transparent manner. So if there is a misconduct allegation, there needs to be a clear process of what to do um, should that happen, because that's a serious allegation and a serious a problem should it proven to be to be true and correct it could um, affect uh, organization's reputation it could create all sorts of issues so it's it's very important that there is a clear process from the management side again are the processes in place do they know what they are to manage any misconduct and escalate it to the board as required okay um within this principle as well i should mention the whistleblower protection framework, which is something that the board may need to consider, depending, um, just consider that uh, to protect those who reported wrongdoing. Also, um, I read about a company that only recently decided to provide a third party independent confidential service through which staff and volunteers can report misconduct. So. Let's say if I'm a staff member, I may feel unsure or uneasy about reporting whoever to my manager and then my manager knowing that I said something. So sometimes it's good to have a, an independent party that staff can report to any misconduct. Okay. Now, principle 10 relates to culture. And I would like to start talking about culture by sharing this Chinese proverb that says the fish rots from the head, 
I'm sure you've heard it before. So if the board, if the board, well, it is the board's responsibility to set the culture for the whole organization. If the board hasn't set it up or hasn't defined what that desirable culture is, that's going to show in the whole organization as well. Um, whatever the culture the board is showing within themselves, within their meeting, within the way they operate, that will filter down to the whole organization as well. So it's very important to consider, is there a defined desired culture that aligns with the purpose and strategy? Again, this is not something that happens in isolation. It's always linked back to the purpose and strategy. What are the organizational values? Are they updated? Are they still relevant? Is there a strategy to develop and maintain the desired culture throughout the organization? We can't just be a piece of paper that sits in someone's drawer and stays there. No one knows of. It, it needs to have a strategy, a communication strategy, a strategy around it. Which mechanisms are in place to monitor and evaluate organizational culture? And is there a clear reward and recognition framework for staff? And I would say probably staff and volunteers. On the management side, is the desired culture spoken about and demonstrated by management day to day? Now, remember that the board needs to demonstrate that. They need to set it and they need to demonstrate it. But management also needs to talk about it and demonstrate day by day. How do we manage staff who do not display the desirable culture and values? And again, I think it links back to the code of conduct as well. Are current recruitment practices aligned with and hiring with the culture and values in mind? Are we hiring, having that in mind? Or are we hiring for the skills and then um, having all sorts of trouble because the values are not there? And are decisions made every day taking the values of the organization into account? Again, I strongly recommend that you have a good read of and a good look at the attachments that we are going to send to you as part of this um, webinar because there's a lot of information there. These are just some of the considerations and some of the questions that you need to think about, but there's also the checklist and there's there's um, a lot more under each of the principles for you to, to consider and um, and then decide, you know, sort of where 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 can your board and your organization improve? Now, looking at governance in practice, I know I have mentioned a few examples of, you know, real um, providers. Now I've got another three that I'll share with you just briefly um, of some issues that different providers were having and what sort of go good governance practices um, resolved once implemented. The first one is about a multi-site CHISP provider. This was um, a provider that was and still does create um, having sort of group group activities and group group classes in, in different regions, in different uh, suburbs, I should say, not regions. It's not regional. Um, it's it's um, here in South Australia, so providing in different areas. And when, when this was first established, and I'm probably going back in you know, 10 years. When this was first established, this motor site was established in a way that the organization decided who the manager of, of that site was going to be. And then that manager put their team together, put the schedule together based on the needs of the clients within that area, which really makes sense, 100%. They, they considered the needs, they considered the ones, they considered what was happening within that area, and then they set up the program in accordance to that, which is great. The problem is that you fast forward that, um, and now there were three or four different locations and the services being provided to clients within those locations. When the board went to look at a little bit more um, to look at the financials of of the locations over time 
it was showing that there was a significant um, difference in profitability. So one location was doing really well financially, one location was doing terrible, one location was losing money. And they're like, why this is happening? So some people were went in, some people from the business, from the organization went in to sort of do some business analysts um, and, and did a sort of a deep dive into each of those locations and what was going on. And the findings were, were the, the main findings and challenges were that um, there was inconsistent pricing. So while CHISP will say a range of what you can charge for a service, all the locations had selected a different price point for the services they were providing. Um, so they were charging different rates for identical services. Um, which, is, which then was reflecting on their profitability. Also, as I mentioned before, they had varied service offerings. So they had some, say, exercise classes that were the same, but some were quite different and didn't attract funding at all because they were sort of outside. Um, it was like, oh, let's also offer this. Oh, it doesn't matter. There's no funding. The other, the other classes will sort of cover that. So because there was no centralized oversight, of those locations, and, and that had been the case historically, for the last probably five or six years, each location had done their own thing, even though they were under the same banner. So the solution, the first thing was to implement a centralized governance structure. So we're looking at pricing, operations, service delivery, which classes were offered, how often, et cetera. Um, Another thing that the, the team looked at as well was staff utilization. So some staff members were only were employed. So staff members were employed full time in the locations. One staff member was only working like 40 percent or 50 percent of the time just because there was not enough clients within that um, area. But they were still employed full time, whereas other staff members were utilized like 80, 90% of their time, even more, pretty much, you know, the whole time and were like quite stressed and whatever. So that was creating issues as well. Um, so then it was looked at utilization, standardized pricing, training and support, standardized service offerings. If something was not funded, um, Either the price was increased or that was taken altogether. And the result obviously was improved profitability, but also enhanced the, the quality of service was also enhanced because there was oversight and um, the organization knew what was going on across all the different locations. With the second example um, is one that uh, I see a lot of, um, and unfortunately, which is the lack of policies and procedures. So it could be that the company has got none at all or that the ones that the organization has are just really, really um, you know, old and have not been updated. They could have been there for the last, say, seven, eight years without any updates. So this example was one um, cheese provider providing maintenance, uh, sorry, gardening and cleaning, maintenance, gardening, and cleaning. Um, but they had, they had a small team, very loyal. The team had been there for a long time. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why, you know, they had an updated policies and procedures because they all knew what they were doing. The problem happened when one of the staff left and then a new staff member was hired, but there was no, you know, there was no documentation that was no, well, the documentation that was there was not suitable for what that staff member had to do. So what, what had to happen there was uh, development of new updated policies and procedures that were relevant for, for, for that team. A structured onboarding approach as well, which before had been done, um, in a quite, you know, relaxed manner, not structured. And then cross-training and mentorship. So the new staff member and the existing ones 
um, could share that way. But potentially, if if all of those staff members have left at the same time, <coughs> excuse me, that would have created a big, big issue. In this third case study, it's a provider that was having some trouble. Well, the board was making decisions very slowly or not making them at all. When this got investigated, the main reason for that was that the reports provided by management were being provided um, sometimes over four weeks, sometimes over six weeks, sometimes over eight weeks, depending on the month. As a result, it was very difficult for the board to compare the data as it related to different periods. Well, so the lack of consistent visibility was a problem, the inefficient data comparison and the limited transparency of what was actually going on. The solutions was that first, there was a, a meeting between, you know, management went to the board and said, this is the information that we are provided. Is there any other information that you need? Is this sufficient? How often do you want it, etc. So that was the first step. Then they decided on that report was going to be done monthly. I know it's earth shattering, but that's what they decided to, to do that monthly. And then they implemented a more automated reporting um, system as well, because one of the issues was that um, staff were taking, you know, two to three days to create their reports. So they preferred to create as few reports as required, um, which makes sense because reports are trying, uh, sorry, staff are trying to do their work, but the board is also trying to do their job. So in this case, by talking to each other, deciding what those KPIs were going to be, deciding what the, the reporting that the board actually required was, um, management went to a you know, sole trader that was doing some reporting, some dashboards, et cetera, created those over two months, trained the staff to do them, and they dropped from taking, so it was taking about four, four days of staff time, not each staff, but in total for that team, to create reports. It dropped down to six hours a month. So uh, obviously the board was much happier <laughs> because now they had reports they, they actually made sense with information that they wanted. The staff was also happier because now they had to spend less time doing the work and the data was more consistent as well as some of those reporting processes were automated uh, by better systems. Next steps, you may ask. I mean, we have covered a lot of content and, and so many um, principles and so many ideas and so many questions and so many considerations. Now, here are four steps that um, that you may you know consider doing. And the first one is obviously you need to consider the resources available. By resources, I mean obviously both the resources that George and I will be providing you um, in the attachment, but also the human resources and hours that you have available because. These changes are quite significant um, to depending on the governance um, levels that, that you have right now. But it could be that you would be changing um, quite a few things in your current processes. So you need to consider you know, how much time and effort you and the team and the board want to dedicate to this, because it could be that you decide that, you know, okay, we're going to go one principle every three months, and then we will address that. That's fine. Or you may go, okay, we'll do a principle a month. And then by this time next year, we'll have covered all the principles and improved everything um, under each of them. It's up to you, but it depends on resources that you have available. Then you need to talk to your board and exec team. Um, it cannot be something that you do by yourself. It's impossible. It needs to be an absolute you know, team effort and everyone needs to be um, not just involved, but also uh, championing that. The next step is an internal audit. So you need to know where things are at um, so that you know what needs to be uh, changed or improved or 
implemented. As I mentioned before, I have created, looking at the, the principles, I have created a checklist uh, for you to sort of work through as part of this internal audit. Uh, more than happy for you to, to sort of use that as a, as a starting point. And then the last one is implement the required changes. It looks really simple. It's just, a, you know, one slide. Um, but these would be, you know, hundreds of hours of work. I don't say that to scare you. I'm just being realistic about um, the effort required here. But as I said before, I strongly believe that if, if you improve your governance uh, over these next many months and before the changes come to well, CHISP and HCP, of course, um, in 2025, you'll be in a much better place and much better prepared to deal with the changes that the new um, system or scheme will bring. Now, I'm sharing some resources with you as well. So, the first one is the AICG website, which I mentioned is the Australian Institute of Company Directors. They have a number of tools and resources specifically for not-for-profits. Some of those resources we are already sharing with you, which are the principles and also that report with the survey, the governance survey for 2022-23 of um, directors in not-for-profits. So we're already sharing that, but there's a lot more. There's articles, there's... Um, yeah, a number, a number of things. I would strongly recommend you have a look at that. So that yeah, it's all free, it's available. You don't need to be a member to have access to that. Secondly, we have the Governance Institute of Australia. Now, they offer a number of different online programs and also face-to-face -face and events related to governance. Um, you know, you can be a member as well, et cetera. I thought I'd mention them because they are sort of the big body for governance alongside with AICG. Then we have the clinical um, governance that I mentioned to you. These, from memory, um, these are for, this is a paid program, by the way, I need to disclose that. I'm not earning anything by mentioning them. I'm just mentioning because I really, um, I've seen the content of this specific program and it's very strong in the clinical side, obviously. Um, so if you need you know, to know more about that aspect, I would strongly recommend this program. And then we, we've got some uh, free resources also at Board Pro. Now, Board Pro, they have a system and they're trying to sell stuff, but don't worry about that. Just go to, to the area where they have like webinars and resources. And there's some really good short videos. For example, this one that's about board composition, it's about 30 minutes and it's all these different board members discussing that topic. So whichever area that you want to know more of, um, I think they have, from memory, they had six videos specifically about not-for-profits um, and boards. So that was, you know, it could be a useful resource to you as well. And finally, I would really like to thank you for your time. Um, I know it's, um, you know, it's a bit dry at times. It's a lot of information, but I do hope that you have, you know, uh, learned something and that you implement some good changes within your organization as well. Thank you very much, uh, Lena. Thank you for, for presenting. Very good and very, like, I really enjoyed it. I've taken so many notes as you were speaking. And I hope um, everyone who will be watching this recording will also find it very useful. Now, if you need any additional information, please do not hesitate to, to contact me um, at my phone um, or at my or by email at george.kuzunis at mccsa.org.au. Thank you once again and have a great day.